Hey everyone, I'm Lisa Chastain. I am the founder and creator of my company and podcast, which is The Real Money Podcast. And today I'm on a mission working with women in personal finance. I do work with female uh, women in business also, and I'm on a mission for women to become the leaders of finance in the world. I realize that's a big mission, and I do know that there's a lot for us to accomplish together as women, and that's exactly why I'm having this conversation tonight with my friends Sue Herrera and Kendra James Anderson. We are having a conversation tonight about women and money, specifically what gets to happen, what needs to happen as women become a part of the largest wealth transfer in America. Today, there's ten about $10 trillion dollars owned by women in America. Percentage-wise, that's about 10 to 15% of the wealth in America. That's a big gap for women. Knowing that 30 trillion is coming our way in this decade alone, tonight's conversation is centered and focused on how we as women can come together, support each other, champion one another, and ultimately continue to move the needle forward toward leadership in corporate America, in our own lives, financially, not just in America, but for the world. But we're going to talk about women in America today as well. Sound good? Welcome to my... Sounds great. Yeah. All right. Welcome to my guests, Sue Herrera and Kendra James Anderson. Sue is a longtime face of CNBC, where she still contributes as an anchor at large, moderating panels and with some of the heavyweights of the money world. She's coming to us live from New Jersey, just down the street from CNBC. I'm so grateful that you're here, Sue. My pleasure. It's great to be with you. Yeah, we had a great conversation before tonight's live discussion. And I'm just, I'm really grateful for the woman that you are and the work that you're doing in the world today. Thank you. It's great to be here. And, um, you know, I've, I've covered Wall Street for 40 years and corporate America. So there's, there's a lot to be done and there's a lot to talk about. So I think it's going to be a great conversation. I know it will. Kendra, I'm so grateful you're here. Welcome. Uh, officially, Kendra is the CEO uh, and virtual CFO of the Finance Femme. She's coming live to us from Dallas, Texas. We were just talking about her life as a CEO and as a mom. And I just know this conversation is going to be so um, enlightening for so many. And I know I'm just look, looking forward to having fun because I can talk about this stuff all day long. <laughs> so welcome to the conversation, Kendra. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm I'm with you. I can talk about it all day long. So I love all day it. long about it. That's right. So Sue, well, let's start with you. Um, I want the audience to get to know you and your your personal experience. You've been with CNBC, but how did you get started in the world of journalism? What's your journey been like a woman a woman um, as a woman in the corporate world? Right. Um, well, I went to I grew up in Los Angeles and I graduated from Cal State Northridge with my degree in journalism. And um, I assumed that I would work for local news mm -hmm. and maybe maybe work for a newspaper. But L.A. is the second largest market in the country and nobody was hiring, especially a girl right out of college. And there were women in broadcasting, but not not a lot, frankly. And I got into business news because cable was just beginning and there was a company called Financial News Network, and they were looking for young people who didn't want to make a lot of money uh, to write and produce. So I applied knowing absolutely nothing about business. As a matter of fact, when I, I when I got the job and I went home and I told my father, I said, I got a job covering business news at Financial News Network. He put his hand on his head and he said, I'll give you two weeks. You You can't you can't cover business. And I was like, well, that got my damn. Up. And I was like, yes, I think I can. And you know, the rest is history. I mean, I was there for eight years and then I left to help start CNBC, uh, which was owned at that point by GE and NBC. And so that was my first foray into a larger corporate environment. So I was going from a very small business news cable network to 30 rock in New York city. And mm -hmm. it was, it was um, quite a learning experience. And I was down on wall street and there were three female journalists, myself, Consuelo Mack and Susie Garrow. 
that was it. Mm-hmm. And um, it was it was hard. It it was hard. You know, it was all guys. But yeah. you just kept going. That's what you did. And I, I loved my job. I wanted my job. I needed my job. And there was no other alternative. Let me yeah. put it that way. I, I loved what I did, but there really was no other alternative. That was it. That was it. And I think that, that that's the story for so many of us is that we say, you know what, we're going to make this happen. Thank you for being a leader in this space for us. And and hearing that, I'm curious, Kendra, you, you, you know, switching gears to you, have you always wanted to be in finance? And what I know, so when I started in finance, nobody ever grows up saying they want to be in, in insurance or a financial mm-hmm. advisor, <laughs> right? Or that they want to be a virtual CFO. I had no idea what any of that meant growing up. But for you, how did you find yourself in the, the money world? Uh, well, you know, I actually... <laughs> I, I was always very interested in finance. I was always very interested specifically in business finance. And so okay. um, I went to school for corporate finance. And as soon as I graduated, went into working in corporate finance. And so um, that actually was something that I've always loved doing. I've always been like a spreadsheets nerd. Okay. You know, I help my mom do the grocery list, in Excel every week. Like, you know, so that was, you know, just the way that I really enjoyed, um, you know, doing things when I was younger was actually learning about entrepreneurship and business. However, I never thought that I could actually be an entrepreneur. You know, it was always like, oh, I'm interested in business, but I worked at in corporate finance, you know, for for 10 years. And actually I was at GE um, when I ended up doing my business on the side. That's what I'm talking about. I know. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, you know, I was there in corporate and I realized I actually kind of stumbled upon entrepreneurship because a friend of mine um, had a boutique and she was doing really well in business and was like, hey, can you just help me, you know, understand my numbers a little bit more? And I'm like, sure, let me talk to your accountant and, you know, we can run some numbers. And she's like, I don't, an accountant, like, I don't have an accountant. She's making millions of dollars at her boutique in, in Dallas. I'm like, you don't have an accountant? Like, who's who's looking at your number? She's like, it's just me. I don't have anybody. And so that's when the light bulb went off for me that, You know, there are so many women who are doing amazing things in entrepreneurship and with their business, but they're not supported. They're still able, even though they're not supported and don't even know their numbers, they're still able to do amazing things. What could they do if they were supported? And Mm so meanwhile, I left my job at GE. I was they were going to make multi billions, whether I was sitting in the office or not, you know, but but she wasn't going to have to close her doors if I didn't support her, you know, so. Um, so that's where the transition came as far as like leaving corporate and going into starting the business. Amazing. Amazing. And today you're helping exclusively small businesses as a, as a virtual yeah, business. Exclusively yeah. women owned businesses. They're all women owned businesses. Um, and whether it's product based, service based, but the one thing that they all have in common is they're all women owned businesses and they're all crushing it and killing it. And they all now understand the value of, um, of being supported and that, yes, it's important to know your numbers and the, the analysis and the analytics and all of that, but it's also just support. It's like mm-hmm. having someone else to ask questions, you know, like, right. you know, having another woman that you can kind of go to and ask questions where you might feel intimidated, maybe asking, you know, someone that's a male that might be in the same, um, the mm-hmm. same industry. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. I, I love what I do and I love who I get to support. And thank you for the work that you do. I found that in personal finance, it's a very isolating conversation for for women and for men, to be honest. Men and women are both isolated when it comes to personal finances. But then when you when you put on top of that, the pressures of running and owning a business and feeling like you have to do it alone. I'm so grateful for the work that you do. And I'm also been, been able to work with business owners, female business owners to say, hey, you know what? We don't have to know it all. We don't have to have it all together. We can be really good at what we do and we can bring in experts to support us and destigmatize money. For me, I feel like it's been very stigmatized, which is why I'm on a mission to have these open, honest conversations. So thank you for sharing that, Kendra. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about walking in our worth. We came up with this conversation because I know that there's been a lot of female empowerment and empowerment around money. When I came onto the scene about 10 years ago, I didn't know anything about money coaches. There were very few money experts that I was familiar with. And this industry has grown a lot, even in the last 10 years. And so aside from just empowering women, 
this is the time for women, knowing that we have the largest wealth transfer coming to us. There's more women business owners than ever, 12 and a half million women-owned businesses in America. And that number continues to grow. In what ways, Sue, we'll start with you. What ways are you seeing women stepping into their worth and walking in their worth today? Well, I think some of it uh, recently has been triggered by the pandemic, of course, that changed the dynamic of going into the office versus not going into the office, being seen or not being seen um, by those who are are above you. Uh, I also think women are tired of having to do all of it, whether that's being a mom, being a career person, um, whatever that entails. I think previously, though, women did not necessarily think they had a choice. There, was, Whether that was because they needed a corporate-sponsored paycheck and corporate-sponsored uh, insurance, or whether they really felt they needed a safety net of some sort. I think women feel much more comfortable after having to fend for themselves during the pandemic um, in trusting in themselves. You know, I, I, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that that probably started, Kendra might have a better sense of it than I do, but I saw it start in earnest about, I'd say seven years ago, mm -hmm. where people, women specifically just said, I, I can't do the nine to five because there are other things I want to do. And those other things are X or Y. So the only way I'm going to be able to do X or Y is to be able to be out on my own. And is that scary? Yes, it is scary, especially if you are responsible for the family income and you're responsible for medical care or you have a child with developmental issues or you know whatever it is that's going on in your life. I think previously women did not feel empowered to take that step out of the gerbil wheel. Mm -hmm. And about seven years ago, I, I saw a number of my friends just say, I just, I need to, to be accountable to myself and my family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, families go through different stages and your kids go through different stages. And sometimes you're needed more and sometimes you're not needed as much, but those times when you're needed more and you can't be there, I think that's a very heavy burden on women, especially men as well. Mm -hmm. I have to say my, my husband is a fantastic partner that way. Um, but I think women bear the brunt of, of that. And after a while, you just need to be able to say, I can, I can be there for you. I can do this. And that's when I started to see the change. That's about when the change happened for me. <laughs> I was like, I got to go back to work. I was a stay-at-home mom. And I knew I had to go back to work. I wasn't quite sure what kind of work I was going to do, but I knew that I didn't want to go back to corporate America. Mm -hmm. For right. that reason, I wanted to be able to do things the way I wanted to do things and quite honestly, dress the way I wanted to dress and have some different freedoms. I'm curious, Kendra, for you, how are you seeing for yourself, yourself walking in your worth and then also for the other women business owners that you're supporting every day? Yeah, I, I actually just piggyback on, on two things that, that both of you had shared. So um, when Sue mentioned the pandemic, I, I too saw a big shift when the pandemic happened. And I think I'm sure there's a lot of different components to it. Right. But I think that with, you know, kids um, having school at home and, you know, we're work from home and maybe your partner is working from home. This the dynamics changed so much. I think that there were a lot of um, women who like something has to change, like this, mm -hmm. something has to shift or change, or maybe it, it allowed the opportunity to kind of create something on the side, like a small business on the side. And well, I'm already home. Let me see if I can do this. And then when um, businesses started having folks come back into the office, there was just like this moment of, nope, not doing it, not coming back <laughs> into the office. Like I got a taste of it. Why would I come back if I could do it from home for a year? Why do I have to come in now? And so there was a lot of that resistance. Um, and so, yeah, around the pandemic, it's definitely when I saw a big change. And also, also to Sue's point, about seven years ago is when I started with the finance room as well. 
Um, and but what I noticed was that was when there was a lot of that empowerment era, right? That was when there was a lot of empowerment, you know, conversation. And and I think that we had a good solid few years of empowerment conversation and then pandemic hit. And it was like, OK, now I need tactical, tangible advice. Like I'm empowered. I know mm-hmm. that I can do this. I know that I need to do this. Now I'm ready to do this. What's the next step? And so I think that pandemic time er- time frame um, really maybe fast forwarded um, some some of us to, you know, take it a little bit more serious and, and accelerate, you know, maybe starting our business or um, was, scaling our business. It was kind of like, if not now, never, you know, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. in, in a, I mean, you don't want to call it a silver lining, certainly because the pandemic was horrible. However, I think it did um, allow women, especially to, imagine what could come next because I mean, I know you work for GE, Kendra. I was under GE. It's, it's the most corporate of corporate. So so you get into that, that mode and it's hard to think outside that box because there's so many things you have to complete in that box by a certain point. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell Mm -hmm. you a funny story. Um, GE, of course, is a big conglomerate. They owned all, you know, they own this, that, and the other thing. And we had to complete like in-service things, uh, like safety things. So this is when I I knew that um, at some point I would exit corporate America when I got the electrical engineering in-service questionnaire that I had to complete (laughs) And the chemical engineering in-service questionnaire that I had to see, she's nodding her head, that I had to complete that had nothing to do with broadcasting, but you had to be in compliance. It was all about compliance. And I think a lot of people who, a lot of women who are working in corporate America, they understand the concept of compliance, but they're tired of compliance. Yes. And and they, they saw that opening of, you know, if, if I can get some support from people like Kendra, I, I can do this. Yeah. And it was that that opening, I think, that we saw. And I think people were shifting into doing more of what they love. So in when you're creating your own business, you tend to, you know, do something that you love doing. And so, you know, even if you look like I love my corporate job, I love the job itself. But, you know, to be able to do that and actually transform someone's business and their livelihood, like that's far more important to me. Right. So I think that was also a perfect opportunity for those of us to, um, yes, step out of those restrictions in corporate, but also do something that's a lot more fulfilling. Um, And I think priorities even change for a lot of folks around then of like, okay, maybe I'm bringing in less money overall. But my mental health is better. My work-life balance is better. We're already home, so that's better, you know. So I think that was that was definitely a big um, time of of shift. I think so too. I think so too. And so in the next this next stage of of women outside of empowerment now truly walking our worth. What I'm noticing and what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of imposter syndrome going on. That yes, we want this, and yes, we're here, and yes, we're doing this. But with the, in the world of money, I say this all the time in my in my world is that women didn't even have the ability to own their own property until the 1900s or the late 1800s, and even then, they had to be married women. For me, I think it's just a big learning curve. Now here we are. We're taking on more business. We're becoming leaders in corporate America. We're becoming presidents of countries. And still there's a gap. There, there are some needs for education and real open, honest conversation for women. For you, Kendra, what kinds of conversations are you having with your, with your women business owners about how do we bridge that gap of, okay, we're here, but there's a whole lot that we don't know. And then also we have a whole lot of history that men don't have when it comes to money. Oh, absolutely. And um, what we work through a lot with our clients is, um, a, a little bit of like mindset work, right? Which is crazy because I'm just big on like strategy and I want to like just bust out the Excel spreadsheet and like build out a financial model. But I realized that sometimes 
Um, I have to have conversations with different women in different ways. I can't just go straight for the, you know, invest all of this money here or hire this person in, at this salary. There's different ways that I have to kind of come in with a conversation because there, there are different histories that we have with money. Um, but I, I will say that I feel like for the most part, you know, um, since we've gone through that empowerment era, um, I do think that we are primed and we're ready to hear it. We're ready to receive it now. So even though, um, there might be conversations of, OK, listen, in order to make your business do this, we're going to need to invest money here. And that's going to be, you know, maybe a fifty thousand dollar investment into this thing or a twenty thousand dollar investment into this thing. But now it's um, it's it's easier, I think, to digest now after we have some of those conversations and you just understand how to maybe relay that information. Uh, but there is still there is still, unfortunately, some of that, that you know, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. I mean, it's. It is what it is, right? But there is just some of that that we have to deal with. Yeah, and and that's that's why your company exists. I believe that is that the more women who are like, hey, we're not only figuring this out ourselves, we're here to help you figure this out. You having the money sav- savviness that I never had um, I might be calling you. <laughs> Be like, hey, let me pick your brain. Let me let me help help you help me. Um, but I, I'm definitely more about the emotional relationship with money because 95% of the decisions that we make are in the subconscious mind, which means they are emotional. For men and women, women get that bad rap of being emotional with their money, but everyone is. So in the absence of having strategies and systems and mentors and tools. How are women women navigating this, Sue? What are you seeing, at, um, well, you know, at, at CNBC or globally? Mm-hmm. It, it's interesting that you say that because yes, I think all you have to do is look at what the stock market does, and that will tell you that money runs on emotions. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I when I looked at the Dow earlier today, it was down three hundred points. Interest rates were backing up. The the ten year yield um, was hitting bumping up against 5%. And so that does tell you, I mean, Wall Street is a herd mentality and it's always worked that way and it always will. The change that I have found is, and and some of this, my my daughters are both 20 now, um, their generation is more comfortable with money than older generations. Mm -hmm. They they expect to make a decent salary. Um, they they expect to have to invest. And maybe some of that is watching their parents or their peers' parents, um, you know, either invest money, lose money, uh, have to pay for college, whatever it is. Uh, my daughters learned from a very early age, the chances of their not working for a living are zero they're going to have to work for a living. So find your passion. And hopefully once you find that passion, you will be able to make a living, but they're very comfortable with, with the concept of being independent and they have no intention of, you know, having their, their significant other run the money. They want to be involved in it. And that's a change that I have seen with, with, younger women more than older women. I find older women are less comfortable with the concept of investing um, because they equate, and and Kendra, maybe you can comment on this, they equate investing with potential loss rather than Mm -hmm. equating investing Mm -hmm. with potential gain. Mm -hmm. And it can go either way. I mean, you Mm -hmm. have to be comfortable with the fact that when you put money to work, in stocks, for instance, you have the potential for either a gain or a loss. Mm-hmm. You know, if you put it in a high yielding CD, which we have these days now, um, your potential for loss is much less. But they're less comfortable with those conversations than a a slightly younger generation. And I, I'm not quite sure why. Maybe because they know they're going to be in the workforce. Maybe they're just more self confident. They've grown up. Um, yeah. you know, their parents work, their moms work, whatever it is. I, I find that encouraging. What I worry about is the women that are my age or younger who still are not comfortable with the concept of managing their money. And they luckily have somebody like Kendra to go to um, because I, I do think that 
when you're not comfortable with money, it's very hard to be successful. Agreed. You know, and, and, and women are not social about money. Men mm -hmm. are social about money. Mm -hmm. They, they go to clubs, they go to golf courses, they, you know, belong to the same clubs. When they get together, they talk about investments and this and that and the other thing. And women tend not to do that. Mm -hmm. And so men are much more comfortable discussing the concept of money than, than women are in general. Absolutely. And, and I agree on that too. Um, as far as like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. No, go ahead, Kendra. Um, I was just going to say as far as like generations as well, um, because I do see even, even just like with my clients and the ages of, of my clients, my younger clients, I mean, I'm talking some clients that are in their early twenties that are yep. killing it. And they have absolutely no problem taking a large chunk of those profits, reinvesting it back into the business. They're like, oh, I see that these ads are doing well. I'm going to put more money into here. Or sometimes it's like, well, I see the ads are doing like maybe a client that's my age or, or older. They might see it and say, OK, well, maybe these ads are doing well, but that might have just been an anomaly. I don't want to put that same amount of money back in there. I'm uncomfortable. And I'm like, you see what it did. The numbers aren't lying to you. You know, so I think that there's definitely a generational component to it. And I think also. Um, an element of um, community that might be, you know, maybe social social media might have play a part in it of like kind of showing what could be. And so um, I think there's a lot of more conversation that maybe we can't have or maybe we're just not having the golf course conversations, but we're popping up on certain pages and certain um, live streams where the conversations are happening now. And so I think that's playing a big part into why it's now easier and more of a conversation. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think social media plays a big role in access and what we saw during the pandemic and how we've seen different things happen globally. My 15-year-old son comes to me. He knows about things happening on the global stage before I do. You know, I'm working all day long. He's on his phone, on TikTok or whatever. And that's absolutely. more accessible. And with that, we're seeing more women have more success. And at the same time, statistically, we're still not, we're moving the needle forward, but there's still a big gap. I mean, that's 30 trillion coming our way. Today, it's 10 trillion in America, but men still own the majority of the wealth. That's why this conversation matters because it's our, it's our job. I believe that in, as women in business, women in finance to say, what can we do more? What needs to happen more for women? For me, personal ownership, that this is my job, that I have to step into the ring and start having these conversations. But there is a bashfulness because women, we're championing in education. We own all of the degrees. We own the majority of all of the degrees from associates all the way up to doctorate level degrees. And somehow with money, there's still a shyness Maybe at a, you know, the, the youngers hopefully will teach some of us who are older how to do this, but how do we bridge that gap? I mean, I know that's a loaded question, but how do we do that? And that's yeah, a good question. Right? I, I mean, I think it is more, more conversation, right? It's more conversation and, um, and more transparency. And I think that there's transparency as far as like conversations that we can have here, but I also think that there's transparency that falls on like larger corporations about salaries. I mean, we can only do, you can only do so much with the, the check that's been cut from you from, from, you know, your corporate job or the income that's coming into your business. But when that's all that you have and you don't know how that stacks against maybe your male counterpart or mm -hmm. someone else, then you really don't have any compare it to. So wages is definitely a part of it. Um, and uh, knowing, you know, what, what to do as far as in the business, as far as like reinvesting, but it's definitely just continued conversations, but transparency in those conversations, right. I think is, is huge. I think wage transparency is essential. I know at NBC, when something is posted, a job opening, they're required to post what the salary is mm. and you are allowed to challenge you know if there are, are multiple positions say there's multiple positions for a producer um you are allowed to ask is is the pay scale equitable across each one of these positions mm. now if one of them is an executive producer position that's going to get paid more than the producer but i think pay transparency 
is is really important. I think empowering women, young and old, to have difficult conversations about pay equity is important. And that's going to take a while because it's hard to go in and say to your boss, you know, I heard that Tyler's making more than I am and I'm doing the exact same job. But, you know, I, I think that that is going to take a while, but I think that is key. Agreed. And I do think Younger people are more comfortable having that conversation because they feel that they are entitled to equal pay. Mm -hmm. Whereas women from my generation didn't necessarily think we were Mm. entitled to the same pay as, for instance, my male co-anchor. You know, that's just the way it was back then. And, um, you know, it changed when ratings became more important. And if your ratings were really good, they raised your pay. Right. But if Mm. your ratings weren't good, they could say to you, you know what he makes, he gets better ratings, you know, and, and, and it was more of a a subjective decision, but I do think transparency in terms of the conversation, transparency in terms of pay grade and Mm. comfort level of conversations. The one thing that does worry me is Women of my daughter's generations, I mean, my daughters are are used to conversations because I work in news and I made them talk. It drove them out of their minds, but I was like, we're going to have a conversation. (laughs) And it really did. It drove them out of their minds, but now they can have a conversation. I have interviewed young people for positions at CNBC and they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're not used to talking. Mm-hmm. They're used to texting. Mm-hmm. And true. I think that is a conversation or a text that needs to be had with, with younger people, whether that's in a, a classroom, whether it's, you know, th- through Kendra talking to younger people, younger clients that come to her. Um, but I, I try to empower them to be able to actually look people in the eye and have the conversation because people, bosses get uncomfortable when you stare them down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and if you have a coherent, well-informed conversation, it, it empowers you. And I do worry that even though younger people are more comfortable with money, maybe, they're not as comfortable with conversation. And that, mm-hmm. I don't know what you guys think about that, but that's just my observance. I totally agree. I totally agree with that. I mean, that, that, that makes complete sense. There, there is a lot of head down text, text conversations. And, and, and to your point too, I think it is a kind of, a, um, an, an opportunity to somewhat meet them where they are. And so maybe it is, um, like you mentioned, maybe workshops or for sure some sort of education. I mean, this is like a whole deep conversation, right? About education and teaching about finance, like needing it to be a required conversation in high schools and maybe even before high schools. But I think that would be a a huge game changer as well. Just, um, you know, making it something that's actually just a part of our curriculum. But, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's getting the education and the information, having, um, uh, um, giving them the confidence to have the conversations, but giving them the confidence to also utilize the skill that they've learned about money management. And so it, it is some of the entitlement, which, you know, is actually a pretty good thing because they're going to, they're going to demand and get what they're worth, which is the start of all of this. You know, that's where Agreed. things are going to really change. Agreed. I've been in rooms where we've been having conversations about boomers and millennials and the, the women boomers were looking at the women millennials saying, we wish we were more like you. Mm-hmm. And I do think that our gen, our Gen Z and millennial generations are leading in a new way for, for women. And also working on the mindset side of things is that we have these imprinting years, these really important imprinting years where a lot of our beliefs about ourselves are imprinted in us. And in, in a lot of families, people don't talk about money, even though there might be more access to that information the actual conversations about what we want, what our needs and desires are. I want to open up a conversation of not only do we need to know more about money and we want to be more comfortable with money, but what does it look like for us to be leaders financially? 
And I'm so grateful that the three of us are in, I think we're all different ages. I'm in my forties. Right. I won't, I won't out you in your, That's in your 65. age, but yeah. <laughs> I'm 65. I'm, hey, listen, if I can get to 65 and still be working. Hallelujah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Please. We I'm need you. That. That'd be awesome. We need you, Sue. We need you. Um, but we, I think also have to model what financial leadership is, what it feels like, embody it. And for so many women, there's nowhere to look back to for that role model. We have to find them in corporate America. We have to find them as mentors. We have to find them somewhere. So when stuff hits the fan, there's someone we can go to. And I, I believe that women are going to do it because we're so different. We're going to take on leadership roles and take on financial leadership in a different way than men. We can't just model how men have done it. And that's my call to action for everyone. A part of this conversation is let's champion each other and continue to role model and mentor other women. And the only way, in my opinion, that happens is through conversation at a coffee table. I mean, I'm sitting at a coffee table in my studio, but at a coffee table sharing what's really going on. Are you getting a lot of those conversations, Kendra? Cause it can't, it's not just about numbers, right? It's like, what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. It's, it's stepping into a, um, a leadership role as a CEO even. So, you know, as these, the business owners are, um, yes, we're talking numbers and we're talking about their financials and analytics, but it's, um, how do they actually run and operate this business so that it is sustainable and how do they empower their team even to, um, do whatever, you know, mission it is that they're, that they're pushing through. So there's a lot of, um, step, if we call it like stepping into your power suit, like there's a lot of stepping into your power suit that happens in these conversations. Um, because you, it's, you know, you gotta, you gotta really walk into it and really own it because it's a big task to not only support your clients or your customers, but also to support your team. And it can feel a little overwhelming, but I feel like when, um, when you have someone to support you, when you have someone that's there that can help you through those conversations, um, also with just fellow entrepreneurs, like not just your, your CFO or other leaders on your team, but mm -hmm. even just other entrepreneurs you're um, in community with, it definitely helps. It, and it really, you know, ultimately it really ties back to community. Like it just keeps going back to like community and conversation and transparency. And we can't do it alone. No one person can do it alone. You really do have to lean in and lean on other, um, other think, people and other women. I think one of the, one of the key issues is mentorship <laughs> and not being afraid of seeking a mentor, not viewing a mentor, especially if it's another woman as competition, uh, yeah. maybe find a mentor that's in a different field. The other issue for women entrepreneurs, especially, is access to capital. Agreed. And that that there's there's a big roadblock, I think, for a lot of women. One of the things that I have found is that community banks or banks that have a strong tie to a smaller community are better lenders than the big guys. Mm -hmm. And so if women can learn to, you know, have a, have their business account at a smaller community bank, obviously one that's FDIC insured, that goes yes. without saying. Um, and you develop, you develop that working relationship with that banker, male or female. It's kind of the same kind of conversation that guys yes. have with each other about money. It's just you're talking about your business and your money and what your plans are. And in, in my neck of the woods in Bergen County, there are a number of small community banks that do lend to female owned businesses because they know them from the community mm -hmm. and they're a better risk because they've lived in the community for most of their lives. They've done small businesses, maybe maybe a family-owned business that they're now taking over and they want to expand it. Um, and they have a relationship with their small community banker who who wants to have a good standing in the community. It benefits both. Right. You know, the community bank wants to lend to the community. And if the community happens to be populated with a lot of female entrepreneurs, that's a great opportunity to set up that relationship that is 
it's going to be impossible for you to do that with a with a, uh, you know, a Bank of America, mm-hmm. not impossible, but it's going to be hard to mm-hmm. have that relationship with Bank of America or JP Morgan Chase. I mean, correct me, Kendra, if you, if you think I'm wrong, but yeah. it's just a different, it's a different dynamic. And, mm-hmm. and the bank is vested in a different way. Mm-hmm. If your business goes down, Chase just writes it off. Yep. If your business goes down, the small community bank is holding the bag and probably can't write it off quite as easily. Mm-hmm. So it's just a different dynamic and a different conversation. And it may be a way for women to get access to capital and also become more comfortable with the concept of debt, which is another I was just going to say that. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I think that there's a big stigma around debt in general. Women who tend to be less mm-hmm. risk, who are more risk adverse financially for now, not every woman, but typically I think we we approach it with more caution because we do want to make sure that our families are staying together and that our businesses are successful. Thinking about how women will do business different or do do business differently is that I think that we, we invest in people differently um, for, for I think a number of reasons. So how, how do, you know, I have ways in my own company of sharing stories about how there is no such thing as an overnight success and that also you're going to have to invest in your business. You're going to have to have some skin in the game. And the truth is for so many women, we don't have money. We don't have access to money in, in so many ways. And for business capital, Kendra, what are some things that you're doing to help your clients bridge that gap to embrace business funding? However, that works for them. Yeah, I think a lot of it first is um, so there's there is debt, but there's also there are plenty of grants out there that mm-hmm. are targeting um, small businesses, women owned businesses, minority owned businesses. And so and they're literally just like waiting for people to apply. I mean, the, the amount of folks that apply is so low compared to what you would expect for twenty thousand dollar checks to just get, you know, um, given to you. But so the first thing I would definitely say is look at grants, look into grants for sure. Um, but with debt, I think the biggest thing with debt is the strategy. So yes, there are some folks who will be more comfortable with debt and some that won't be. But I think that overall, you have to talk through what is the strategy for this money and how are we going to then get this money back, you know, make it make money for us so that we can pay it back and pay it back on whatever timeline. And so I think it's a matter of understanding your comfort level with debt so that you can know how much you actually are comfortable with taking and how quickly you need that money to actually then generate money for you. There's no one size fits all approach. And so I think that, I think the stigma of debt is lessening. And I think folks are getting more and more comfortable with understanding that debt is sometimes just necessary to grow and scale a business, but um, in, in most cases, but, um, but it's the strategy and it's the understanding of your personal uh, feeling about debt and how much you can hold. Because the last thing that you want to do is actually be able to acquire the debt, but it makes you so nervous that you can't actually move in your business. And so then you're losing out on the opportunity to make that money, make money for you because you're just so worried about the debt. So it has to be at your comfort level. And the fear of failure. I think women, women take failure of a business um, or a venture or an idea. I think they take it. it very it's personal. a heavier burden. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very personal. And they feel like they've let everybody, especially if, if you're running a business that has team members, yeah. you feel like you've, you've let them down rather than, I'm not saying all men do this, but, but a lot of times men are much more clinical. If, if, if that's the right word, they're more clinical about, a potential business failure, maybe because they've run businesses before Mm -hmm. um, and they know what happens. And we saw in the pandemic, a lot of companies went out of business. A lot of family owned businesses couldn't survive. Um, But there was also a rebirth of, of entrepreneurial spirit too. But I do think women take potential failure more, more personally because we're nurturers we Most are. of us anyway. And um, we want to nurture the idea, nurture the team, nurture the, the the success. And when it when it doesn't happen, which occasionally is the case, I think we take it we take it's a very heavy burden for us. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a great way to shift and, and close out the conversation thinking about what's next for women, that there are these, we, we know there are some gaps and also I'm really excited about the future for women and these conversations that are happening in my world all of the time. And when I think about how women have, have grown with money and all of the work that we've done, American women, I do believe we're leading the way. We're championing other women in the world and wanting to then help other women in the world have freedoms that we have today. In the book, Think and Grow Rich, the, there's a conversation in the book about how every successful man has a woman that's inspired the success we're not going to, I mean, <laughs> it's a different conversation about building wealth as women compared to how, how men have done it. And the, and the, the thing that I can think of the most is that we're going to do it by supporting one another. It won't be, you know, necessarily yeah. some, some women will step out and, and in front and before the rest of us, but that the rest of us get to collectively continue to support each other. I know in my business, that's made a profound difference and impact for my ability to stay going on days that are really, really hard. For you, what's made the biggest difference in your lives as you continue to champion yourselves financially and other women? Kendra, why don't you go first? Because you're running your own business. <laughs> sure. I mean, I'll say um, for me, really, when I had my son three years ago, everything changed. And, you know, prior to that, the focus was, you know, build the business, build the business, build the business, work all day, work weekends, do what you need to do, build the business. And I thought that was great. And at the time it was fine. I could do it. You know, I had the, the energy for it. And then he came and I was like, okay, wait, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I can't build it in the same way anymore. Yeah. And that was a shift for me. And he was born during the pandemic. He was born in 2020. So it, it was a, a, a forced shift for me at that point on, um, business is not just about the profits. It's also about the peace that it brings you. You have to have both in your business. And so that was when I shifted how I worked with people, who I worked with. And I think that, um, I think that the great thing, like to Sue's point about how women are nurturers, I think that the great benefit that we have as women is that we can more easily intentionally go into building and scaling our business with that, with the understanding of keeping peace in mind, you know, cause we, we can't, we don't want to rock the household. We don't want to rock our energy, you know, so we, we aren't, um, not necessarily as aggressive, but we're just more mindful in how we're building out our business. Mm -hmm. And yes, sometimes that can be more cautious and that might slow progress, but at the end of the day, it's more intentional and it's probably, you know, better for our nervous system. And so I think for me, that was the shift when I, when I had my son, but, um, I also think that just, across the board with women, we are doing a better job at building with intention and with mindfulness and keeping both of those things in mind. What are you seeing for the next? Yeah, go ahead. So you're ready to jump in. No, I, I just, um, I think for me, when, I, I, although I'm still with CNBC, I'm also building a business outside of CNBC. And for me, it's being an example to my kids so that they I have two girls and a boy, um, and full disclosure, I've always made more money than my husband. My husband's a physician, but mm -hmm. uh, physicians don't make what people think they make. Uh, news anchors make more. He's always been fine with that. We've always been very transparent with our children about that. And I think it has empowered my daughters to be okay with maybe making more than whoever they choose to spend their life with, or if they choose to remain single. And for my son, I think, I think it has been an interesting thing for him to see that, um, that women can make more women can do more. And just because you're a guy doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do as well in your career, maybe you will, and I hope you do, but you know, they're, they're more elastic yeah. to how the economy and work and money really works. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm very mindful of the fact that I need the, to show them how to use money correctly, how to build generational wealth 
how to, you know, um, learn to live within their means, especially in areas of the country where you have a lot of wealth. Mm -hmm. Kids are very susceptible to what other people have and what other people do. And we made it very clear that we aren't always able to do that. Mm -hmm. I went from zero to three in one year. Mm -hmm. We adopted the girls. I had a baby and I had three babies at home. And trust me, I was not going to Pilates in the morning <laughs> with all the girls and then going for coffee. I was, I was trying to get a shower in. Okay. Um, that's where I was, but it was good for them to see that. And it, it, it's good for them to see that you have to work hard, but there's opportunity, but, but don't be intimidated by money. It's just paper. It's paper and plastic. Use it. Yeah. Don't, don't be intimidated by it. That's what I'm trying to do. And for, and for my, my kids, friends as well. Amen. I, I agree with you about that. It's it's time. This is the conversation. These are the conversations that I believe as women in our in where we are in our careers, we are positioned to be leaders and to lead this conversation and champion the world of money for women in America, women all over the planet. And for that reason, I'm so grateful that you're here with me tonight. So thinking about the someone who's watching this, regardless of what age or where she is in her life, for each of you, I'd love to close out with what's on your heart to, to share to someone who's watching this wherever she is in the world today. I would say um, just never doubt yourself. You know, the world is a tough place. Uh, it, it can be very overwhelming, especially these days. And it can be overwhelming on a lot of different fronts, but you are your own champion and never let anyone tell you that you cannot succeed. Will it be easy? No. Um, but when I was down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange getting pushed by a bunch of guys because I was the only woman there, the ladies room floor was three floors down. They just mm -hmm. didn't think it was necessary. Right. So um, and I just refused to go away. And I think that's something that I would, I've, I've told my daughters, I tell women all the time that may be having trouble in the office. Don't back down, just have confidence in yourself. It's not always going to be easy, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Kendra? And, What's on and your heart? I would just say, yeah, I would just say, I mean, you're here. So if you're here, you know, listening to this now, then it means that you're wanting to, you know, learn more or, or consider more when it comes to, to yourself and money. And so that's a big step and to just kind of, just to continue down that path, but to continue down the path with grace, like understand that, you know, it's not going to come to you overnight. The knowledge and understanding and everything that you feel like you need to know is not just going to come overnight, but to just continue to, um, trying to inform yourself and connect with other women. Um, it's going to be difficult to be vulnerable. Sometimes we want people to be vulnerable with us. But we have to be vulnerable as well. So sometimes it's going to be difficult, but just continue to go down the path and just grant yourself grace as you're, as you're doing that. I love that. Thank you so much. I don't know why that the image in my, that popped up in my head of Tom Hanks in um, the baseball movie about women, what was it called? A league of their own. And he's like, there's no crying oh, in baseball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the truth. <laughs> here's the truth. Hearing you both say that, that there are tears and there is sweat. Oh, and absolutely. It is, it is a, a journey worth taking for yourself, for your family. And for me, the freest I ever felt was when I knew that I didn't have to rely on anyone for anything, that I could pay my way that I could invest in how I wanted to invest, that I could be a business owner. I can have conversations about things that matter to me and no one needs to give me or you or anyone permission for that. So thank you, Sue, yes. for being a champion for us tonight. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank oh, you for thank being you for a leader. Me. Yes. Kendra, I'm so grateful you, to know you. I, I told you, I think I, I might've told you at the beginning of tonight's conversation. I'm like super fangirling both of you. So I'll be following you on social media and I'm just really grateful to be on this platform in this conversation with you tonight. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, for any of you who are watching tonight, you can find Kendra through my social media on Instagram. Kendra, is there anywhere else you'd like for them to reach out if they want to get a hold of you tonight? I mean, the website's always easy. So the financefem.com is always an easy place to, to find us. 
Great. Thank you so much. And Sue, they can stay in touch and watch all the amazing things that you're doing out in the public eye. Um, and we'll, you know, if you have any questions for Sue, you can let us know. We'll let her know. Again, thank you so much I'm on for. The, I'm on Instagram. So yes. They can send me we, a message on Instagram. That's perfect. Around. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. We'll make sure that we have those tags in our on my Instagram page as well. But to all of you who are watching tonight or whenever or however you are in the world, hopefully this sparks a conversation within you and for you to champion yourself and other women in the world of business, in corporate America, and with money. We are walking in our worth. We are we are encouraging you and inviting you to the, do the same. Thanks for watching, and we, we hope to see you on the next conversation of Walk in Your Worth.